All right, everyone, let's get, uh, let's take a seat and we'll get started here in uh, just a few seconds. Hey everyone, um, I'm Joe Arnold from SwiftStack. I'm Clay Gerarn, I'm a, a core contributor to Swift. And uh, we're gonna be talking about uh, Swift, bigger than big. And I guess the topic is Swift scales massively. How massively does it scale, Clay? As big as you want it to go. And so it's architected for that, and you can add nodes. Um, also, things like new drives and new servers are coming along, where yeah. Uh, density is going up, and I, there's been an evolution in Swift over the years, because when did Swift start? Um, Swift started back in, uh, well, I mean, so OpenStack started about five years ago. Yeah, and uh, a couple years before that, before Swift that, we were working on Swift. So there's been evolution as, as the, not only the use cases have grown in size, but also the, um, the type of, of, of hardware that people has, have used has also changed. It's also grown more dense. So we're going to talk about that. Um, all right, building for scale. So what are we seeing? Like today, um, uh, or yesterday, we saw Expedient talk about uh, they're a service provider. They've been building out a storage as a service. That means lots of users are all on in the same storage. We have you know, folks from OVH doing exactly the same thing. So we're seeing more concentration of more storage in fewer pools. So that puts some you know, pressure on the size of the yep. environment. Um, there was one of the original use cases, but then it's, it's opened up from there, and it right. became open source technology, and more people have started adopting it and applying it in all kinds of ways that we didn't expect. Correct, and like uh, you, have, you have Swift being deployed all by its lonesome in these environments in places like entertainment, and where media files are going from 4K to 6K to 8K, so you have these very large repositories. Um, ORM, OMRF spoke earlier yeah, today, great. and they're in the life sciences space. Similarly, there's not a, an OpenStack compute environment, it's just storage, and they're storing um, uh, whole human genomes in that, in that storage system. Scientific computing use cases where you have uh, microscopes and um, uh, lots of sensor data being put into the cluster. Um, enterprises, we're seeing backup, we've been talking about uh, NetBackup and Commvault. So many different applications out there in the ecosystem that people are just picking up off the shelf and plugging right into their object storage. And then software as a service application. So instead of everyone having an Exchange server running in their closet somewhere, they're using Gmail. And, but that pattern repeats, it, repeats itself all over the place. So yeah. more concentration, more data in um, fewer domains or mm -hmm. instances. Yeah. Um, the other thing that's been interesting, and again, six, seven years ago, yeah. Like we saw four terabyte, two terabyte drives. This is very exciting. This Those are big, big drives. drives. Yeah. Um, but now, 10 terabyte drives, I mean, I think that's what our, is standard order yeah. nowadays. Uh, 10 terabyte, eight terabyte drives. We have, I think you can buy 12 terabyte drives now. And in the next eight, 16, 18 months, I think Seagate talked about having the 16 to 18 terabyte drives. Mm -hmm. 20 terabyte drives were right on the corner. I mean, these are, big monster drives, yeah. and we won't think so in another 10 years, but right now, to us, they feel right. big. Um, the other thing that's happened is the chassis, yeah. right? So you have, in the beginning, this is like a, a, a 24 drive 4U chassis, and all right, that was big a few years back, and now, hmm, 60 drive, so it's this, you know, the Seagate S3260, and that's pretty common chassis for people to roll in. That's a lot of, uh, a lot of, disks per CPU and core and uh, system. Yeah, well, it's worse than that. I mean, as the, the chassis are getting denser, they're not really trying to apply you know, more CPU and more memory. They want to even do with less. The JBODs are, are taking less resources. Um, and so this has been one of the, the biggest challenges is, is uh, that we've been working on over such a long time. We've been doing this for a long time. And the ecology of how the hardware is coming together and that people want to apply to their storage problems is changing. And so we've been keeping up. Yep, all right, so let's start. Um, uh, I think we have to kind of cover some of the basics of Swift, right, though, to yeah. kind of give a context of why some of these things are. Well, it's another right. dimension of scale. The, the nodes themselves are getting smaller, but the mm -hmm. clusters are getting bigger, too. The geographies that we're tackling are changing. Right, and also multi-region is a thing now, right, where we have multiple regions that people can deploy. So that means you need to communicate and replicate data across um, uh, more networks that aren't necessarily close to each other, and even in the public cloud instance where we're, having to, we're replicating data out to the public cloud. So you have to deal with more of these things happening rather than having 
uh, rack of gear and everything within the same data center yeah. now. So it's like this perfect storm of Swift is being adopted more and more in the ecosystem to all kinds of new challenges. We're getting on denser hardware that we didn't have available to us whenever we started architecting Swift. And they're deploying it in even more complex uh, topologies. So as they're wanting more out of it, they're gasking more of it, uh, and we're doing it with less resources and applying to un, you know, new, new areas of space. So it's been a lot, of, a lot of fun. A lot of fun. All right. So the architecture components. So we have just one slide on, on, on this, uh, just on an overview. So right, reliable, scalable yeah. object storage core. Right? That's the sort of the meat and potatoes of the storage system. And the architecture goals, uh, like high durability, high availability, and scale and needing to achieve all those things. So it's, it's a shared nothing architecture, meaning that um, uh, there, no, no, each node in the system is a, is a worker bee and it's doing what it needs to do and it's not, it's not necessarily needing to coordinate with the other nodes in the system um, in a synchronized way. Uh, fault tolerant, any single node in the system can go down or you can have two halves of the cluster not be able to talk to each other for a period of time, and then come back up online and be able to recon reconnect and resynchronize with each other. Um, the automation around replication, where uh, if things like drives go bad, automatically the system can repair itself and um, begin to, uh, to, to raise the durability level up to where it needed to be, needs to be, um, and continuous auditing. So detecting errors even before uh, a user might detect an error constantly sweeping through mm -hmm. the system. Mm -hmm. um, so, and, and then the, you know, the, the durability strategies of using replicas in the system and erasure codes in the system. Mm -hmm. And those the, the erasure codes are new in the past few years. Yeah. Um, and, and those have an impact on some of the processes yeah. that are doing all the things on that, on that, on that right-hand side we need to be taken into mm -hmm. an account. Mm -hmm. And so let's, yeah. let's yeah. talk about the ring. Okay. So, do it. So one of our um, saving graces as we're getting applied into all of these new challenges is those design tenets of the architecture. What we wanted the system to do. Uh, it's interesting how one design goal sort of begets into a, the, the implementation. Uh, so if you want to have horizontal scalability, you have to design a system that's shared nothing. You, you have to have ways to reduce contention and coordination between the nodes. Uh, so one of the foundational pieces of the Swift architecture is the ring, um, which is just a, a consistent hashing ring. Um, that's, you know, that was proven at the time. I mean, consistent hashing as a concept has been around uh, since the 90s. Uh, and uh, Swift you know, takes that concept and extends it further. Um, but that design um, sort of begets into uh, the implementation and the way that we have to do rebalancing. Uh, so if you have a, um, take your entire namespace, rather than keeping an index where every uh, one of the 10 billion or more objects that you're loading into your cluster, you have to go update indexes, have a lookup table, you can use, uh, you can use a hashing algorithm, display things across the node, and then you break that up into partitions in order to um, have more nodes that you can float around as you add capacity to the cluster without having to move around a lot of data. So when we add some data in here, you can see node three came in. A few of the partitions have to be reassigned. Every name that could potentially come into the object has a place that it has to go, but whenever you add new capacity, you have to change that some of the partitions have to go on other nodes. So in designing for a system that um, can you know, ex extend out, um, where we want as you add capacity to the cluster, you're actually growing the available resources that are there for you to do things like um, uh, aggressive active replication, where we want to repair the system back to a fully consistent state as soon as possible. You want to have background processes that are always auditing. So as you're adding new capacity to the system, you want the whole system to grow, not just have the few nodes coming online to handle the new ingress as you sort of stack them on the end. The whole system has to grow together. Right, because there's like two choices when you're adding capacity into the system. It's like, so do you want all the new data going into the new storage nodes, or do you want the new storage nodes to like take the brunt and yeah. take some of the existing storage in the system, no. and the workload of, of bringing that data to the system? Right. But as we get into um, bigger nodes and larger geographies, we're being asked to do all of those same consistency sort of work, but we need to optimize it. And luckily, we've had a lot of time and a lot of deployments on which we can do and learn how to make that work really well. And that's what we have a lot of data around, right? So um, we have a, 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 a product to help deploy and manage uh, Swift. One of the, one of the, the 
key parts of that tool is the ability to add capacity in the cluster. And it's building the rings, it's redistributing those rings. And so we can watch a bunch of stuff about the rebalancing activity that's happening. How long does it take for us to add the new capacity into the cluster? And adding the capacity to the cluster involves not only just changing that data structure, mm -hmm. but also obviously moving the data to that new capacity that's there. Mm -hmm. And so we can watch, okay, how long does it take to add um, a new server, especially these new, you know, 60 drive bay, eight terabyte drive chassis into this into the system, or people are expanding out and adding a whole rack of that. How long does it take? How long is the replication cycle times? Mm -hmm. How long are the audit times taking? And we can watch that and have that inform some of the, the designs. In fact, I mean, we have a whole monitoring page. I mean, Clay, you're involved in a lot mm -hmm. of this. One of Clay's uh, graphs of the week that he mm -hmm. always likes to right. uh, point out. Like, yeah. just just watching. The, the the rebalancing time yeah. in customer accounts. I, and, and this has been a, a thing of you know just adding the visibility to understand uh, when you know in a particular environment some environmental issue is causing things to not behave the way that we want. Like how can we get a real clear picture of that at a glance? Um, but all and so that we know what to go drill down into and think about for the next time that we get into a similar situation. Um, but also you know it's just a, an education thing. Uh, you know working with people to understand the way that object storage and the way that distributed systems you know scale and the way that things work. It's it's maybe different than they've dealt within the past. So having some clear visualizations and a lot of insight under the covers and what's going on in the system can help people that maybe you know, are operating or ma monitoring, managing their Swift cluster as just one of their part-time jobs to get up to speed really quickly on what they need to do and what they need to understand on how these clusters grow. Right, okay, so, and then let's, let's, so let's talk about some of the optimizations, right? Sure. That's, this is ostensibly what this is about. So mm -hmm. um, the, f the first was just targeting um, being efficient on writing data to disk and queuing it up so that you don't have to be as um, random about writing data into it and, and take, be more sequential about writing the data. Yeah, just you know, anything that we can do to uh, eliminate um, you know, a minor stat call here or a read call there. Uh, and a lot of times you get this you know, via profiling. Uh, you know, we have various metrics that are being emitted from the system and a large community of deployers that are all looking at these together. Uh, so there's a constant feedback of, hey, are you guys seeing this? Uh, or I see this thing in one particular node or we have an opportunity, we get some tracing data. And then we go, we look at the code and we reason about it and we say, well, what if we organize this differently here? And so, you know, Oh, especially over the past year, there's been a series of small minor patches that have made changes down in the disk file and the updates that we do to the, uh, uh, the, the hash pickle and other things to do append only stuff instead of doing a de read, de update, deserialize um, repeating thing. And it's just every little one that you can save, every little IOP that you can save really pays off a lot. And it's going to be, a, you know, it's a continuing thing. Uh, we've got more work going on in the community to uh, change the, some of the wings that we do in the background of replication, some of the even dramatic things that we do on disk files for lots of small files use cases. Mm -hmm. um, so really, really exciting. And it just pays off so much at scale. It seems like a minor thing. It feels like we're micro-optimizing. But because this is something that's happening tens of thousands of times on disk, it really pays off. Um, one, of the, one of the next things was um, while we're doing rebalancing, we talked about all those auditing and replication processes that are going on. But those are there to detect when things are not connected, or something is failing in the system, or a disk has gone bad, or, but when we're in a, in a replication state, like we know we're adding capacity, or we've detected that there's a disk down, um, can you talk about some of the optimizations that we've made there? Yeah. Um, so there's a, a, a number of different things that, uh, that you can do. So first of all, that, that continuous auditing in the system, uh, one thing that you have to be able to do is apply some back pressure um, against, uh, so that you're trading off for you know, new incoming requests that are coming into the system as the replication's going on. And it's a, it's a trade-off that operations needs to make, where they have some new capacity online, they need to get that uh, capacity participating in the cluster as quickly as possible, but they're also servicing their client requests on the same system, uh, so they need to be able to trade off there. Uh, so focusing that work that you are doing during a rebalance stage so that it's focused just on making that new capacity fully in use on the cluster and trying to avoid other work, deprioritizing other work um, that uh, is not directly related to the rebalance is a big change that uh, is, is going on in the, the reconstructors and the replicators right now. Uh, we've actually, I've actually taken a few ideas from the erasure code implementation, uh, which is slightly different than the replicator implementation. And 
and um, you can, but they're both involved in the rebalance process, and so there's been some feedback and cross-pollination, and I think those two will continue to converge in the code base. So, okay, so I mean, the analogy here is don't pass code, don't pass $200, right? So it's like, don't wait for the replicator to tell you you need to move some data, just start moving the data right away. Yeah. How is that different with replicas versus erasure codes? Because I, um, in terms of, like erasure codes, you have two choices. Mm -hmm. um, replicas, you can just move the data, because it's a whole replica. Right. Um, erasure codes, you can either reconstruct or you can move data from yeah. once it was to where it needs to be, yeah. what are some of the choices made So there? that's, this is one of the things, uh, the, the parallels. So in the reconstructor, um, because uh, we've actually got fragments of data in EC, no individual uh, piece of data on disk constitutes the entire object. It's just a parity or a clear test data that's part of the entire system. Um, none, none of them are the same. They're not replicated. They're unique. They're their own little unique piece of the object. So during a, a partition reassignment, when a ring, ring rebalance, we have to just move those partitions onto the, the new primary holder for that specific one. There's no coordination that needs to happen between the other instances that are also holding fragments during a rebalance. You only need to do that whenever you're cross-checking for doing a rebuild. If a disk is gone, if you've lost a server, or even a controller maybe went out and you have to rebuild all of the data on those disks, then you use the other pieces of the data in the cluster to reconstruct uh, one of those missing objects. Um, that's not a property that exists in a replicated case. Any one of the replicas can stand in for it. Um, so in one hand, the, the erasure coding can move more quickly during a rebalance because it just has to put that one fragment right where it goes as opposed to checking with its peers. But in the other hand, it, it can be more expensive if you um, if you're, you know, end up trying to rebuild as opposed to just moving that data. Um, so one of the big things that we need to work on, on the, or one of the things that we're working on in the reconstructor is to be able, maybe that's actually coming up. Yeah, this is, this is exactly it. So, I mean, this touching on this exactly, which is the erasure codes, where calculating erasure codes does use more RAM. It uses more CPU. And yeah. so, yeah, continue right where you were. Yeah, so the erasure coding, um, has been great. It's, a, it's an opportunity for uh, operators to reduce their total storage costs. Um, but they're asking for that at the same time that they're giving us less resources. And I'm not, I'm not, not fussing at anybody, but uh, you know, these chassis are getting denser and denser, and we have less CPU and less RAM to work with. Uh, so erasure coding has been uh, one of the big drivers in understanding what we need to do to work better on these larger chassis and the optimizations that um, we need to uh, make. Um, so. Um, so there have been tactically a few things that have been developed in order to, to make that work. So for example, mm -hmm. like having multiple repli or, uh, uh, reconstructors running per sets of drives. So that yep. way if you have a big chassis with 60 drives, you can say, hey, these six drives or these 10 drives, you guys get your own dedicated uh, reconstructor mm -hmm. to operate mm -hmm. uh, and rechecking the data to make mm -hmm. sure that it's- And again, prioritizing the rebalance work over um, the replicating uh, work, uh, the, the reconstructing. So next is multi-region. Mm -hmm. And um, so there's been a, a multi-region clusters, of course, allow a, um, a, a deployment to have data in both locations. And the, the way that ha it has been implemented is to have even placement. So you have region A, reg or region one, region two, and you set a storage policy that has a certain number of replicas. And then those would be assigned in each of those regions based on the capacity total in the system. Well, when we started interacting with customers, we realized there, there was uh, use cases where people wanted to go, oh no, I want one replica here, I want two replicas here, I want whatever. They wanted to be really specific about what they wanted per policy. And they could have multiple policies, so that meant that they could have um, they could say no, on the same set of hardware, they can start stacking those policies with different durability properties for each one of them across these different regions. Yeah. And we wanted to just be able to accommodate that right. in a better way. So right. it, was it, wasn't, it wasn't just that they were, you know, they, they, wanted, they were dreaming of everything that they might want. Uh, in in the, the, a lot of the multi-region deployments that we're seeing today that are set up like this, um, they'll have multiple policies where one policy is the primary in region one and a separate policy is the primary in region two. Generally speaking, uh, the applications that are running uh, nearest region two are accessing that cluster. The ones that are running nearest region one are accessing that cluster. But in addition to that being the primary primary storage, they want to have some off-site availability, particularly you know, if they have a hybrid case where they need to pull some data off the, the local region, if it's there waiting for them, that's beneficial. So 
even placement was great when there was only one policy, whenever all of the data was considered even, but as you overlay more complex uh, policy configurations and offer multiple policies, it became more and more clear that deterministic placement uh, on the rings uh, was something that we needed to support. It was also ended up being a requirement um, for, for so, but, so what uh, dig a little bit into more what composite rings are and how they work. Uh, so composite rings are, it's the same um, ring concept that we had, um, but it just allows the cluster to group two rings together in a logical concept. So within one region, you could have a ring that's placing out two replicas of the data on just the devices that are in region one, and then you'd have another ring that evenly places out all of the partitions, a single replica, in region two. Those two um, partition assignments can be stitched together uh, so that when you present to uh, the cluster a uh, composite ring composed of region one and region two uh, as the primary region one ring, uh, it would be able to find partition uh, assignment in both uh, locations. And then that, the next thing, the logical extension of that, of course, is to overlay this with erasure codes. So erasure codes was one of the drivers for, uh, another one of the drivers for um, composite rings. Um, we were talking earlier in the erasure codes that each piece of data isn't a replica of another one, it's a unique piece of data. So in order to do um, a multi-region EC, you can't just willy-nilly or randomly place, uh, evenly place, the fragments of, uh, that make up the object into each region. Uh, you have to make sure that the, the specific fragments that are getting placed in each region can reconstitute the entire object. Uh, so composite rings allowed us to say um, that you're gonna have a set of um, data and parity in region one and a set of data and parity in region two. Those are separate and independently placed, but whenever dealing with the cl cluster logically, you can have the two of them together, but separate them. And so, what is so? This allows to have uh, so. So, for example, so let me ask a couple of questions about this. Setup, okay. Right. Okay. So, if I'm in one region and I'm, I get a request for an object, and I don't have enough parity, say that something tragic happened in the cluster on the hardware, yeah. and I'm not, I'm not able to reconstruct. Do I ask the other side to reconstruct, or do I just pull? You're the consistency engine, or this is a client request. I'm getting client request. So, um, if. Well, first of all, each site is going to have its, it be independently its own failure domain and can support a number of, of failures up to your, your, your parity count. Uh, so if it's just a minor thing, a few things are offline, uh, it will mainly just ask for that, that local region. Uh, but if you have you know, massive failures and there's access requests are still coming through that region, it'll absolutely, it will, we don't like to say not serve data. We're going to reach across the WAN, pull it in, and make sure that we handle that client request. And then the consistency engine. So the consistency engine um, gets to be a little more optimistic. So uh, the direction that things would be heading now is that it's going to be um, uh, cheaper in most cases to get a copy of the missing fragment data than it is going to be to have everyone in this cluster uh, rebuild it. Uh, and it's, it's just going to be quicker, so it reduces the mean time to recovery. Um, so that's going to be the, the, the way that we're going to be going. Cool. Yeah. That's a big deal. So a couple more things. Um, next, one of the things that we've been working on with Intel is to be able to throw some fast storage at doing some specific metadata caching on the file system. And what this does is it allows that the, the requests to the underlying file system to respond more quickly. And I think one, one of the big, big benefits of this and is to be able to re do things like reduce the, uh, the replication cycle times by leveraging a small amount of, of SSD and taking up a PCIe slot, which may not even be used in the system anyway, um, to get some great performance improvements in the replication cycle times. Um, there's also improvements to be made also in the first uh, time to first byte latency. So adding a little hardware to the problem, adding some software like uh, the Intel cache acceleration on the file system um, can give some benefit as, as well, particularly on these, on these, on these dense chassis. Um, and I think there, there's, for those of you at the conference, there's a, they have a, a, a kiosk in their booth um, talking about this, and, and a white paper um, is available on that. So it's something to check out. And I think the, lastly is just a, you know, a, a plug to k try out SwiftStack and test out and do, do some deployments across multiple regions with erasure codes um, and um, get your hands dirty on it. And we um, have the ability you can test drive it with SwiftStack.com slash test drive. And Thank you, and we're happy to answer any questions folks may have. Thanks. Hi. Hey, Mark. Uh, so I'm glad you guys mentioned the, uh, the um, Intel cache thing. 
because uh, we've been doing that actually for a number of years, and, and it does allow us to do a lot more with, with less. We're using DM cache actually. Um, but um, what, what's the recommended percentage of, of SSD per terabyte or whatever? Of I would I would point to uh, j the two folks sitting back in the, in the role row to answer that question. I don't have that information off the top of my head, okay. but I think they'd be help it, happy to answer after the talk. But generally speaking, you're going to be targeting the um, file system uh, directory cache size. Uh, so it depends on how dense, uh, like how many, is it lots of small files or, or bigger files? So you want to try to have uh, as much flashes as you can to keep all of the um, journaling and file system information in memory. Yeah, so it's not, it's not caching the data, it's caching the file system yeah. metadata. Yeah. Data. Oh, you're doing with data? Yeah, we're doing data and then up to the effects control or whatever. Uh -huh. Okay, cool. <laughs> per <laughs> few hundred gigabytes of storage. Oh right, yeah. So John's John's confirming. So it's 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 not a lot, right? It's a few hundred um, few hundred gigabytes. Uh, I think we have terabyte cards and some of the the denser uh, chassis, because it is it's only file system metadata. It's not caching metadata with the Intel cache stuff. Yeah, please. So I suppose this is sort of a question for some feedback. Um, from what I understand, the, the limit at present is five, uh, five gigabytes for per object. And I understand you can do trickery with multi, you know, it supports, uh, you know, Swift behind the scenes will sort of join them together for you in multi-part, whatever right. it's called. Is there, um, is there, thoughts around that increasing or, uh, I mean, or does it not need to happen or are there reasons why it won't or? Yeah, that's a really good question, right? Because um, like we've, we've just matched parity with the, uh, I, there, there has to be some sort of standardization because people are building clients, people are building, like you, for example, if you're building a file system client, you can't just say, hey, I'm gonna have some arbitrary block size that I'm gonna write to this. People have kind of settled in on a, on a, on a size for these object APIs because they're building clients that are working across lots of different installations. Yeah, sure, you can go configure the max object size to be whatever you want. Um, if you can fit it on a single drive. But if you can fit it on a, on a single drive. But in practice, what, what people are doing is they're, they're building clients and they're building these tools to work across lots of different clusters and lots of different deployments, including Amazon, including Google, right. and all of them have We've all settled in on this five gigabyte. Yeah, I think it's all about the clients. I think that tends to be what's driving that conversation is people are building the transparency of the multi-part uploads into the clients because there's a lot of benefits that you can have in resumable uploads, the ability to parallelize the uploads. Uh, and if you're doing that at the data source and then using the object APIs to create a manifest and pull them back together and then you know, serve them out on CDN or some other client that's a client. Yeah, so like, and, and what we're seeing with customers is, is you know, they start using the clients that, 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 that are provided and they just see this to them, they're just uploading a file into the system and, they're, and then sure, that's behind the scenes we're just parallelizing it across tons of servers and they're going, oh my God, this is so fast. Well, you know, it's because we're doing a giant parallel upload for them into the cluster. And, um, and so the users benefit from that because I think it's, it's already ingrained in the client ecosystem that's out there. Okay. So I actually have two questions. One is, um, is there any quantitative way to measure the impact uh, bringed by the data movement? For example, when I want to add a new devices, all remote devices, that definitely will cause data movement, right? So uh, is there any quantitative way to measure the impact? So the how, do, yeah. how to measure the impact of data movement, is that yeah, the question? Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah absolutely. Uh, fine grain monitoring into, into the cluster. Uh, I mean, there's lots of vectors which you can measure that. Um, the, the way that it impacts the object servers that are filling, the way that it impacts the object servers that are draining. Um, so. The answer is absolutely yes, it has a, has a quantifiable impact, and there's knobs and tools that you can use to control that. Um, but I, I feel like we could, we, it, you could, we could talk a long time uh, about it. <laughs> uh, what was the second question? Okay, the second question is, I, I saw you mentioned the cloud native app, right? So is there any special example about 
uh, how a cloud native apps uh, uses uh, Swift? I, I think the biggest benefit that you get uh, in cloud native design uh, to talk to storage behind an API is that you don't have to think about where that application is running to figure out where you're going to store the data, right? And it, like, either you're you know caching it locally because you want it to be close to the application and that's not your in store, or you throw it into, into object storage. That's the final resting place of all data, whether it's a, a backup or something that is user generated content, whatever it is. So for cloud native apps, I think just the idea of just API based storage is is uh, r really important in most of their design. I can't add anything to that. Yeah, last question. All right, so when you're doing multi-region deployments, how is the object metadata distributed and what are the consistency claims on it? Mm-hmm. Uh, so so when, we, when we say the term object metadata, we're, we're normally thinking about the data that, the metadata about the object that's stored with the object, and, and so that, that stays the same. So you'd have that metadata available in both. But uh, the, the way your question was framed made me actually think about the, like, the container metadata, uh, which is the listing of ob which objects are in a container, how many bytes are stored in that container. Uh, and that gets replicated. Uh, most deployments are deploying the, um, the container and account metadata layers across the, in the entire cluster. So it would have replicas in each. Like a eventually consistent on directory listings, like S3, or is it more strongly consistent? Uh, it, just like S3, it's always eventually consistent for the listings inside of the containers, yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, uh, it's um, sort of actively, uh, optimistically uh, consistent. So with every object update, we try to update the listings. Um, so uh, it's just, it's all on the back end, it's latencies and timeouts. Uh, we can respond to the client and have something fail and asynchronously update something later. Uh, hi, uh, good talk. So uh, regarding erasure coding, you mentioned about uh, you need to check uh, whether the data can be uh, re reconstructed or not, right? Yeah. yeah. Is, is, is that happening periodically? Yes. yes. OK. So but if you have a multi-region based erasure coding, then how you know the other side what happens? Uh, so this gets in, into the design of the, um, the uh, multi-region erasure coding. Yes. Uh, it actually draws a lot of parallels back to uh, like mirrored RAID. Uh, so in erasure coding, we're actually introducing, in order to keep the amount of parity calculations that we have to do during ingest to a, uh, to a reasonable minimum, uh, we have a duplication factor where each independent cluster can store a completely reconstructable entity on, on either side of the region. So the primary consistency checks just have to do to make sure uh, internally within the region that the object is fully is reconstructable. Uh, but if it's not, they can then reach across the WAN to get the, um, the information that they need. OK, but this seems like a, actually a lot of overhead in your management perspective, right? So does it mean actually replication will be better? <laughs> Um, the, the reconstruction operation is yes. more expensive than yes. replicating a piece of data yes. uh, because it has to read more data in parity in order to rebuild an object. So in erasure coding, it's uh, more important uh, that you know, we only rebuild whenever we have to. But when we do, you actually have to write less data because you don't need to uh, write down the entire replica. You just need to write down the piece that you're building. Also, there's a lot of optimizations that we have made to do uh, during the consistency checks uh, to basically uh, form the consistency checks up in a ring so that each individual node only has to check with his peers, watching out for gaps in the ring, uh, so that he doesn't have to constantly everybody talk to, to everybody. They can just watch the, the metadata as it floats around. Yes, uh, maybe I, I, I should ask in another way. So for example, uh, if I ask some suggestion from you, for multi-region based design or multi-region based data storage, replicating is better or erase coding is better? Um, oh, it's going to depend on the use case, it, right? So there is, like you, like you pointed out, there is a trade-off to be made in, yes. in terms of how you want to store this. If you're going above two regions, replicated is better. OK. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good answer. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, thanks for sticking with us tonight. Um, uh, hope to see you at the event later tonight at the ballpark. All right. Thanks, everyone.